The FTC decode season is well underway and teams are starting to compete in their regional championships and qualify for worlds and premiers. Now, this strategy may or may not be legal anymore. I'm Coach Pratt. I've been teaching robotics and design for over a decade now. And as we're getting further along in the decode season, let's take a look at some design pivots that your team might easily be able to take and adapt to improve your robot into the next phase of competition. And we're also going to take a look at a strategy that may or may not be legal anymore for autonomous. So first off, we've got a 21 artifact auto here by 23435 gyrobotic droids. So let's take a look at what they've come up with. So I like this robot design because not only can it move while it is shooting, it also has an intake that is moving up and down with that over time. And I think that's quite an impressive low point. Now, this is the strategy here that I'm not 100% is going to be counting as legal anymore, particularly as this robot comes up and grabs from the gate as it's coming by. Shows up in a QA later on, so we'll talk about that. Now, I do like this autonomous because right at the very end, not only does it have a high throughput, so it's capable of moving itself around, but they do make sure that they leave themselves off of that line and they set themselves up to be able to hit that gate right when teleop starts. So really select finish on this. Good work on that team giant robotic droids. Next up here, we've got an interesting looking robot from Attack Hamsters. I think they've got a lot of interesting things going on in this robot. They have a non-traditional chassis design. Why they decided to do that, I'm not 100% sure, but it looks like it's set up for doing a three-directional intake, which is quite a cool little piece here. One question I do have about the design is that with these three-direction intakes, it is unfortunately rather slow. So let's take a look here. We can see it, how it's able to go ahead and pick it up, rotate itself around, already has one in. And even though it picks up those three on autonomous, it's not the quickest in the world, but it does allow them to set up for a nice autonomous that is well sorted. But you see what I mean right here for other teams that may want to think about using the design for themselves? They kind of start to push these balls out of the way and it causes them to move quite slow. So despite having a really interesting chassis design of an X, in my opinion, it's not the most space efficient in that. Now, it is still a really impressive robot they've come up and I do like at the very end here. Let's see if I can find that clip. Where do they have it here? Uh, they also have uh, what looks like some swift slides as well to be able to lift themselves up. And that's where that uh, large foot plate comes in. So lifting up a lighter robot with a few sets of linear slides is 100% doable. Uh, and it's interesting to see more and more teams start to bring this out, uh, especially later on in the season. Next up here, we've got a few robots to take a look at. This is a Chesapeake record. And uh, overall, I think that looking at these two blue teams, despite their team not winning, uh, I do think that for teams on the perhaps newer side of the FTC journey, there's some really interesting concepts to take a look at for how you could go about improving a robot over time. So let's get into the tele up here to talk about that. And let's take a look at this team up in the top left first. This is 16537. Now their robot both has a human intake on one side as well as a standard intake off of the bottom. So it allows them to pick some things up during autonomous, but it also allows them to be able to fire these things out as well. They've swapped into what looks like a tank-based chassis. It's possible. I don't think that's mechanism. I believe that is a tank-based chassis because there's no strafing going on in this. And it does make it a little bit harder for that robot to get pushed away, but there's some lots of bullying going on from the red team that we'll talk about as time goes by. Next, let's take a look at 8630. So we'll go back up. An 8630 is a modification of the, it looks like the starter robot from Go Build Us. They've got four pillars in the corners to be able to add things in. They've got a six wheeled chassis. I can't tell if that's a drop center chassis or not. Uh, it doesn't look like it is. It looks like they have Omni wheels on the front. But this is again a great modification from the Go Build a starter bot. They've got a couple rubber band intake wheels to be able to grab things on from the front as well as a slightly hooded fixed shooter at the back uh, that's able to get in artifacts for the most part. Super accurately all the time, maybe not so much, but I do think that there is a great start here for where teams can go off of that starter robot. So really good work on that out of those teams here. And I just got to mention as well, 
Team 13, 100, and 23, 840. Excellent defense being played on that match as well. From what we talked about last week when we were talking about higher throughput for shooters, some really impressive throughput from these shooters here that they are able to get at quite accurate speeds. A couple large flywheels and then some steel flywheels attached to these as well. We've got Team 23, 511, as well as 23, 441. And we can see just how quickly some of these teams are able to get that throughput through put up, having what looks like two motors driving their flywheel and likely a couple of steel plates. If you are going to try to drive with a steel flywheel on your outtake, I highly recommend you move up to at least two bare motors, if not a little bit lower on torque. Likely what you'll find, and some teams are finding, is that they are having this huge amount of battery drain when they slap on just more weight. And likely it's because you don't have enough torque in your system to be able to get things going up. So if you are going to try this strategy to be able to get some higher throughput, and I suggest that you do, you'll probably want to upgrade your flywheel to have at least two motors in that respect. Next up here, we've got a full match to take a look at. This is the Washington State record. The teams to watch in this match are the Red Alliance. So let's take a look at Red Alliance's autonomous as we get started here. Overall, it seems to be a pretty standard autonomous from teams starting up. And it's nice to see that teams are working together to be able to develop their autonomouses to work together with one another to be able to fire in these shots. Looks like 23849 is, of course, out of the count at this point, but 16965 is still able to not only still open up that gate, be able to still fire in. Uh, one thing of note for 23849, make sure you're moving off of that launch line as well as with 18225. Uh, you're not moving off that launch line. You might miss those. Oh, you do right at the last second. But 23849 does not. That's missing out on those three points, which is a pretty easy gimme to get. And it also potentially means no ranking points. But this, because this is a final playoff, the ranking points aren't as important. But the three points do end up mattering, especially when teams are doing this through the qualification. So I want you to take a look at the defense strategies that 16965 is playing. They do a lot of what teams are starting to call a bump and run. So uh, uh, we haven't gotten up to this point yet, but watch as this blue robot comes in here, they give it a good bump, and then they're able to fire in. And they'll do that a few more times here. They give it a nice good little bump as it comes in. And I believe that 23849 also does that as well. And it looks like 16965 also has a little bit more traction on their wheels. It may be that their robot is slightly heavier, or that they're hitting at a straight position again. But there's a lot of defense being played between 3355 and 16965 as well. Uh, this is something I would encourage this blue team 18225 to do a little bit more as they're coming in around. If you've got a robot in this section that is trying to hit, you can give them a little bump before you move in. Same thing, you just saw 16995 do that, or 16965 do that. Uh, they're about to leave those three balls but as this blue robot is coming around they come back give them a little hit before they continue on and moving forward so nice little bump right there and then they come in and score their shots again so a little bit of bump and a run for instance 3355 huge miss there maybe not huge but a miss there of you've got a perfectly aligned robot trying to fire in would be pretty easy for them just give them a little bump on their way to be able to uh, get to their own target so a little bit of bump and run is a great way of not only throwing your opponent's three artifacts off, but still shouldn't realistically slow down your performance uh, towards being able to fire in three of those artifacts as well. So overall, great match out of these teams and some really impressive defense being taken a look at. Now, last up is taking a look at the question of strategy legality. We've been seeing a lot of this. We saw from the Gyrobotics at the start here, as well as team 16465 here and uh, out of the Feynman tournament here I believe it is 197 oh come on let's actually full screen that it's not gonna let me full screen that for whatever reason but we've also got 19745 we featured this team in a previous FTC Fridays as it comes in and part of the strategy here of 19745 is again going by that gate firing in three and then they are intaking directly from that gate. Now, this strategy may or may not be legal anymore. And this is based off of Q&A 166, intaking from the ramp and a control penalty. So 
If a robot intakes balls falling from a gate as it opens and briefly slowing the ramp via momentary transitive contact, that means that they're touching an artifact and a secondary artifact that is still on the ramp is transitively touched through the artifact they're controlling, does this count as controlling the balls due to -to ball-to-ball contact, and would it violate G48? So as far as the referee's call here for G408 to apply, the definition of control has to be vent, and generally most artifacts on the ramp are not fully supported by the robot. So that means that G408 would not apply in this case. However, G418 would apply to a robot that is in contact with an artifact on a ramp, either directly or transitively through an artifact that is controlled by the robot. So let's take a look at what G418 is all about. So 418 is robots may not meddle with artifacts on ramps. Robots may not contact either directly or transitively through a scoring element controlled by the robot. Artifacts on a ramp, including their own ramp. And you get a major foul per artifact that you are interacting with on that ramp. So what this means is, if we take a look at this robot here, if, we'll pause it right here, if this artifact here is contacting this artifact, while it is still on the ramp, that is considered to technically be a major foul. Yes? So what may be a better strategy for teams that are trying to intake on this ramp is they may want to clip the gate, move over, or what would not count at this point is right now there's an artifact here. If, well, let's actually go back one second. So right now, if this green ball is contacting this purple artifact, that would count as a violation of G418 because it is technically meddling with an artifact that is on that ramp. However, this ball would not count as meddling inside that respect. So what might be a good way for teams to get around that is developing a long enough intake that they could have one side on the gate and then have picking up, if two balls were on the ground, picking up that far left ball because you cannot transitive contact through a chain of balls in that respect. Alternatively, you could quickly open the gate, make sure you get off of the gate and move up just a little bit further so that you make sure that you are grabbing artifacts off of that gate while not holding the gate element as well. Because at least from my reading on the Q&A 166, teams would get fouled on 418 what might be a good idea for teams to do because this is starting to get in the hyper niche of hyper niche categories go talk to your head ref for the day at your match and say hey i saw q166 this is something as part of my strategy looking at what is there would this be a legal strategy for the day or not or talk to your referee before a lot of these are volunteers and they're very open and willing and wanting to uh, help your team be supportive and not breaking the rules. And this is particularly one of those rules that is is going to be hard to score. And I'm curious to see if in the future, there's another Q&A that gets released or an update to the team update manual that says you're not allowed to be intaking artifacts from your opponent's secret zone while you are contacting the gate. Or perhaps this is a strategy that's there. But in my opinion, with how fast some of these teams are able to pick it up, it's going to be really challenging to see is that robot actually transitively touching another artifact that is on side that ramp or not? And it's going to be awfully hard to score. I'm curious your thoughts on this Q&A 166 and whether you think that my reading is correct of that or whether you have a slightly different reading of where that ruling is going. Keep an eye out tomorrow because I'm also starting out a new series called FRC Saturdays where we're going to follow the same things with FTC, but in an FRC context instead. If you're looking for more robotics resources, CAD files, code snippets, things like that, I've got lots of tutorials on my channel down below, as well as in my community. If you have seen an interesting match that you want me to take a look at in a future FTC Fridays, I've got a submission form down below that you can submit things in. And as always, best of luck out there this season.